Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra and today's Westpac Address. My name is Laura Tingle, I'm the club's president, and today's guest is the Leader of the Opposition, Anthony Albanese. I'm sure my colleagues who are racing here from the Prime Minister's press conference up the hill at Parliament House will have many questions for him about how Labor would handle the pandemic better, but he's speaking to us today on the post-pandemic world and the aim of full employment. For the viewing audience, be advised that the club is following the public health directions of the ACT government in relation to wearing of masks and COVID safe practices. Our staff are required to wear masks, but our patrons are not, but are encouraged to do so when moving around the building. There is no requirement to wear a mask when seated. For his first address to the National Press Club this year, everyone, please welcome the Leader of the Opposition, Anthony Albanese. Well, thanks very much, Laura, and I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and recommit myself again to the implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. Can I welcome uh, Tony Burke, Katie Gallagher, uh, Dave Smith, Alicia Payne and Andrew Lee, and uh, other colleagues who are here, including the National Secretary, Paul Erickson. At moments of crisis, Australians look to our leaders to lead. And at this moment of crisis, Scott Morrison has failed to lead. Right now, Sydney is in a 14-day lockdown. Darwin, Alice Springs, South East Queensland, Townsville, Brisbane and Perth are all locked down. As the world opens up, Australia keeps locking down. People who thought the worst of the pandemic was behind us are shocked and are asking themselves, how did we end up here? This government had two jobs this year, rolling out the vaccine and fixing the national quarantine system. Mr Morrison's failure on vaccines has put people's health and their jobs at risk. When he said it wasn't a race, he was wrong. When he said we're at the front of the queue for vaccines, he was wrong. When he said hotel quarantine was 99.99% effective, he was wrong. The truth is, this is a race. A race to protect people's lives and their jobs. A race to return to normal life. Around 6% of Australians are fully vaccinated. The absolute worst among developed countries. Last, absolutely last. The truth is there have been 26 outbreaks from hotel quarantine. Australians are frustrated by many things about this pandemic. But what really gets me is this. It didn't have to be this way. Last year, Australians were magnificent. We all made sacrifices to protect one another. It gave us a big advantage heading into 2021 in what was meant to be the year of the vaccine. That is an advantage that has been squandered. Mr Morrison has failed to put in place enough deals to reduce risk and to do them early enough and in sufficient quantity. He's just done a press conference saying now we're going to have a plan. The truth is he bet the house on AstraZeneca and now we have supply issues with other vaccines. He failed to meet targets for the most vulnerable, including aged care residents, aged care workers, those in disability care and frontline workers. Now he has abandoned targets for Horizons, seemingly oblivious to the fact that Horizons are never reached. And now we have utter confusion. With a late night declaration on vaccines without reference to the National Cabinet, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation or the Australian Medical Association. We are currently short of supply, people unable to make appointments, pharmacists and others sidelined, and a government that's addicted to marketing but which has no proper public information campaign in place. It has no plan for national quarantine and no plan to return Australia to normal life. For Scott Morrison, failing to plan is a plan to fail. I repeat, failing to plan 
is a plan to fail. Labor has a plan to beat COVID. We've put it out there for a long period of time. One, fixing the vaccine rollout. Two, building fit for purpose national quarantine. Three, promoting an effective public information campaign on vaccines. And four, manufacturing mRNA vaccines here. Scott Morrison has no plan, just more confusion and more blame shifting. As the latest outbreak got worse last week, what did we see up the hill in Parliament House? As our biggest city slid towards lockdown, this government's focus was on themselves, on stabbing, not jabbing, on rolling a Deputy Prime Minister, not rolling out the vaccine. Then a reshuffle focused on internal vengeance, not the national interest. A cabinet that has excluded Australia's largest export in resources and excludes the water portfolio after the National Party decided that South Australians don't need fresh water. A government that reminded Australian women of its attitude to gender issues by appointing Barnaby Joyce to the Status of Women Task Force. A government with a Deputy Prime Minister who declared he couldn't care less about the impact of COVID on, Mel in, on Melbourne, although he did use rather more colourful language to describe it. A government which, during a health pandemic, has brought in the most radical changes to Medicare in decades. From yesterday, we know that essential surgeries such as hip replacements will cost Australians much more. And no one can tell those on waiting lists how much more this figure will be. For those who've delayed surgeries due to the pandemic, this will be an even more unfair hit on their hip pocket. Labor will always defend Medicare. We created it and will defend it every day. Let's be clear, we do need to get through this, but we also need to look ahead. It's not good enough to snap back to 2019. Labor understands that need today, just as John Curtin and Ben Chifley understood in the middle of World War II that going back to 1939 would be, at best, a hollow triumph. They looked ahead to a future that was brighter than the past. That was the victory in peace that they were determined would follow the victory in war. Curtin and Chifley's bright vision for Australia was formed at a time when the world was immersed in darkness. Indeed, the end of the war was nowhere in sight when Chifley was appointed our first post-war reconstruction minister in late 1942. They knew national leadership in times of crisis was about more than mere preservation. It was a question of vision, a question of courage. The courage to imagine greater opportunity for all in peace. The leadership to begin that work, even in the midst of war. As part of his quest for a true victory, Curtin asked the great Nugget Coombs to write a white paper on full employment. This helped to transform the post-war environment, setting up a boom that spanned two decades, during which Australia's previously double-digit unemployment rate sat at around about 2%. The white paper was progressive. It welcomed technological changes that would boost productivity, rejected the idea of make work jobs and talked about the importance of work for dignity. It is an energy that I'm proud to say drives me in public life. At the heart of the agenda of the Labor government I'm determined to lead will be the Australian jobs plan. Good, secure jobs are the starting point from which all else follows. Today I'm announcing that a Labor government I lead will commission a full employment white paper. It will draw together experts from across government, industry and the union movement to set out a plan for how we will reduce unemployment and underemployment. We will bring together a broad range of participants in an Australian job summit as one of the first actions of an incoming Labor government. Of course, the meaning of full employment is different today from the post-war period where careers lasted longer and full-time employment was the norm. Today, the headline figures mask the tough reality 
that 1.7 million Australians are looking for work or more hours to support themselves and their families. And 4 million Australians are in insecure work. Now, there's no consensus on what full employment is. The point that I'm making today is that we need to think of the labour market more broadly than just the monthly figures. It will take in the changing nature of the workforce, not least the rapid expansion of the care economy, including aged care, childcare and disability care. It needs to consider how employment opportunities can be taken up by those currently on the disability support pension. And it will seize on the growing importance of jobs being driven by renewable energy. Full employment is about secure work, which will assist those currently in work through driving up wages. It will cut the gender pay gap and narrow the chasms that divide Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. We cannot afford to aim low. The government itself has just spelled out why. This week we saw the cost of this coalition government, not just in the billions of lost revenue from these rolling lockdowns, but in the intergenerational report that was released on Monday. This report paints a pretty bleak picture. It predicts a future of weaker economic growth, a future of budget deficits and high debt, a future of sinking standards of living, a future of declining investment in education, a future of generational debt without a generational dividend. This is the government's own trajectory for the economy. It is an admission of failure. They're in black and white. We did not just drift into this by accident. The government threw away the rudder with its steadfast refusal to invest in Australian education, skills, workers and businesses. What makes this report even more unsettling is that its forecasts depend on our productivity growth rate returning to its 30-year average of 1.5% over the next decade. One word for this assumption is heroic, because the Coalition has no plan for boosting productivity. As Paul Krugman famously put it, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run it is almost everything. What the intergenerational report is telling us is that productivity is now everything. Scott Morrison will blame any weakness on COVID, of course, but that is disingenuous at best. Before the pandemic, our economic growth was at its lowest since the GFC. Our standard of living was flatlining. Wages were stagnant. Indeed, a new report by the McKell Institute found that wages growth is at its slowest in a generation. The average Australian worker is $13,000 a year worse off. When wages stay too low for too long, everyone gets hurt. Before COVID ever reached our shores, household debt was at record levels. Housing affordability was in crisis. Productivity was actually going backwards. Our unemployment rate was higher than the US, Britain, New Zealand and Germany. Our national debt had doubled. Australia was paying the price for deliberate policy decisions made by this government. The hollowing out of our manufacturing sector with the loss of 90,000 manufacturing jobs, the neglect of our skills and training system, the undermining of our universities, the spread of insecure work and the narrowness of our export base. Labor, in contrast, understands that the report's clear and urgent message is that we must actually invest in people so that we can get more opportunities for more people in more parts of the country. Now, unlike the government, Labor understands that one area that will make that possible is renewable energy and tackling climate change. It is one of the most promising paths we have out of the quagmire. That a report making predictions 40 years into the future barely mentions it is a telling omission. Not a word about the opportunities that tackling climate change represents. Labor sees the climate crisis as Australia's jobs opportunity. We see how it can boost existing industries. We see opportunities for technology creation that will put Australia at the front of the pack. The world is changing. 
we have a chance to position Australia for success. We cannot let the dead weight of Liberal and National Party ideology hold us back. The intergenerational report shows that we are on the wrong track because of this government's litany of wrong decisions and its lack of a plan. Labor will get this country back on track and it starts with jobs, secure jobs. What I've talked today builds on the initiatives I've already announced as part of our Australian Jobs Plan. Initiatives such as our $20 billion rewiring the nation project to build us a power grid fit for the 21st century. And it will be delivered using Australian expertise, Australian materials, Australian businesses and Australian workers. It will make an enormous contribution to lowering energy prices for families and businesses alike. We will create a national rail manufacturing plan to build more trains here. Our defence industry development strategy will maximise local content in defence projects, leveraging the $270 billion investment pipeline to put Australian industry, workers and national security first. When cheap, reliable power is coupled with Australian expertise, materials, business and workers, we will be a force to be reckoned with and it will help deliver a future made in Australia, which will let us stand on our own feet. Our major project skills guarantee will require at least one in ten jobs on major federally funded infrastructure projects be allocated to apprentices, trainees or cadets, creating thousands of new opportunities for young Australians seeking job and skills. Our annual investment return from our $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund will build social and affordable housing and create thousands of jobs in the process. I've set out our plan to establish a national reconstruction fund to transform existing industries and jumpstart investment in the industries of tomorrow. Working in partnership with the private sector, including the superannuation industry, this fund will revive our ability to make world-class products. It will commercialise science, innovation and technology. It will diversify our industrial base and develop our sovereign capability. And in the process, it will drive regional economic development and create secure, well-paid jobs. We must be ambitious. For example, we produce 56% of the world's lithium but nearly all of that value is shipped offshore. We must harness our vital resources to make things here in Australia, value add here in Australia, become a key player in multi-billion dollar value chains that create good, secure, high wage jobs for Australians. Labor will, belt, Labor will bet big on Australians because we know that they will deliver. I've spoken before of my experience in setting up Infrastructure Australia and how it informs my plan to create Jobs and Skills Australia, which will advise on the future work opportunities and ensure Australians can benefit from them. This is vital if we are to ensure that Australians can fill future employment opportunities, given the IGR predicts the temporary migration population will almost double over the next 40 years. Let me say this, migration policy done right can lift wages and job opportunities and contribute to economic growth. But as the Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe has pointed out, the reliance on temporary workers by Australian business has, to, to quote uh, Philip Lowe, not made wages responsive to the economic conditions. We must heed the Governor's advice and we must do better. I will launch a start-up year program to drive innovation and increase links between our universities and entrepreneurs. I will facilitate 2,000 new small business enterprises at a time when small business has done it really tough during the pandemic. New firms, new jobs, new growth. We will create a new energy apprenticeships program to train young people for the energy jobs of the future. To contribute to the rebuilding of sovereign capability, we will use the purchasing power of government to buy Australian products and services, 
supporting Australian jobs and skills. We need a government that has faith in the power and smarts of Australian industry and our people. Our plan to reform childcare is the most effective and obvious step to ensure working parents have good choices and our children have the quality care that can set them up for success in the future. It's an economic reform, not a welfare policy. That's why Labor's cheaper childcare plan was one of the first policies I announced as leader. Labor will value early learning as the first step in creating a smarter Australia, one where we invest in early learning, schools, TAFE and universities, because it benefits not just individuals, it's not just a commodity, it is the key to our future economic success. And then there's infrastructure. We've watched as this government has pulled off the magic trick of racking up a trillion dollars of debt, yet actually cut infrastructure investment by $3.3 billion over the forward estimates in the budget. Under the coalition, infrastructure investment isn't for boosting productivity, it's for boosting votes. The damning audit office report on the commuter car park program says it all. 47 projects worth $660 million, selected on pure politics, leading to massive waste, a delivery of just two projects completed, just two. A blatant abuse of taxpayers' money, which should have been called the pork and ride program. <laughs> 10 of the commuter car parks are not even attached to a train station. This was sports rorts on steroids. And the recent budget created 21 separate slush funds to further expand the practice in the lead up to the next election without a National Integrity Commission to cause even a pause for thought. Now, I'll take this opportunity very clearly to remind the coalition that they will get a National Integrity Commission under a Labor government. These rotted programs from a government that ripped away funding from genuine nation-building projects that had been through the infrastructure process, that had high benefit to cost ratios, including Melbourne Metro, Brisbane's Cross River Rail program, and the Managed Motorways program. If the Australian people give me the privilege of forming government after the next election, you will have a Prime Minister who was proudly Australia's first infrastructure minister. I am at the heart a builder, and I want to help us build back stronger. And the way to do that is to ensure that infrastructure investment is nation building and that it goes to where it boosts productivity. As announced earlier this year, our Australian jobs plan is also a plan to increase wages and provide more secure work for more Australians. This includes writing job security into the Fair Work Act, extending the Fair Work Act to cover gig workers, properly defining casual work, cracking down on the abuse of cowboy labour hire firms to ensure people who do the same job get the same pay, exposing and closing the gender pay gap for large companies, 10 days paid domestic and family violence leave, and making wage theft a crime because stealing from vulnerable workers should be met with the full force of the law. Australia has had experience coming out of crises before. When we emerged from the global financial crisis relatively unscathed, it wasn't good luck. It was planning. It was the result of a Labor government that planned urgently but meticulously. It was a Labor government that responded to a moment of crisis and reshaped it into a moment to build opportunity and security for our people and a better future for our country. As a result, unlike most of the world, uh, most Australians kept their jobs. And we invested in our nation. There was a legacy left in schools, in infrastructure, particularly in public transport, in paid parental leave, 
in the National Broadband Network and the National Disability Insurance Scheme. These investments paid dividends. Under this government, there's a trillion dollars of debt. What's the legacy? What's the legacy from that debt? We continue to reap the benefits of our investments today. Wherever I meet families who are getting the help they need in speech therapy or educational support for their children, because the NDIS is there for them, neither our GFC escape nor our post-war boom, set in place by Curtin and Chifley, were accidents. Each happened because of a forward-looking Labor government with plans to make working people better off and take the nation confidently into the future. And that is the energy that drives me. It's one of optimism. But no one owes Australia a future. We have to make it for ourselves. As Prime Minister, I want our country to seize this once-in-a-century moment to do just that. It is a future we can shape with a focus on productivity, on growth, on participation and, above all, on secure jobs. That is the recovery that I want for Australia. A recovery for all Australians. A recovery that is backed by a government that has a plan. A government that is on your side. The current government has no plan for the future and is badly out of its depth in the present. Scott Morrison had two jobs this year, rolling out the vaccine and fixing the national quarantine system, and he has botched them both. My Labor team wants to give Australia a government that gets those two jobs done, but then is determined to build back stronger and create a better future. An Australia in which that central aspiration that Australians have. We just want our children to have a better quality of life than the one that we enjoyed. I intend to help make that a reality as leading the next Labor government. Thanks very much. Well, thanks, Mr Albanese. Uh, Nugget Coombe's white paper was, as you say, in a very different time, uh, and it basically mapped out uh, a role for government which was significant in the post-war years. Uh, once again, the intergenerational report uh, is talking about a very different economy in the next 40 years to the one we've any of us have experienced in our lifetime, lower growth, but particularly lower population growth. Uh, and as you mentioned in your speech, there's a lot of talk about the failures of government delivery. So if I can take you back to the absolute basics of what the white paper and what you will be trying to achieve in government, is it a time when we actually have to start rethinking how important the role of government is in Australia, that we stop being afraid of the idea that governments should actually take the reins on things, that things like vaccine rollouts shouldn't be contracted out, that, that there is a role for the public se sector to actually take a much more assertive role in running the country? Well, the public sector does have a critical role, and I think one of the things that I would bring to uh, leadership in this country is stop the, the hollowing out of the public sector. Um, this is a government that has uh, spent uh, increasing billions of dollars on contracting out, some of which are essential services. Uh, I think I'm very much a, a market economist, uh, but governments have a role in facilitating uh, intervention in order to ensure efficient functioning of markets. But there are other things that are quite rightly the role of the public sector, uh, whether it be ownership, take for example Darwin Port perhaps, or uh, other essential functions that are the role of the public sector, and I don't think we should shy away from that. Uh, what a white paper needs to do, though, is to recognise at the same time that overwhelmingly it's about how we drive a private sector investment. How does the public sector facilitate that and create an environment uh, whereby that occurs in the national interest and takes advantage of the opportunities that are there we're located in the fastest growing region of the world in human history. That provides us with 
enormous opportunity going forward, but only if we seize it, only if we're confident about the future and help to shape the future. One of the problems with this government isn't that it wants uh, to, uh, that it's stuck in the past, uh, it wants everyone to go back there and keep it company. Uh, hence you've seen absurdities like during the last election that uh, electric vehicles are going to end the weekend. We need to do better than that. We need to shape the future in the interests of the Australian people. David Crow. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Mr Albanese. David Crow from the City Morning Herald and The Age. Can I take you from the, um, the longer term future to the here and now? Because, of course, there's a lot of action today with National Cabinet dealing with the pandemic and a couple of issues around. I'm interested in your thoughts on whether you think it's, it's fair enough to uh, support GPs to um, prescribe or advise a younger Australian on getting the AstraZeneca vaccine. Do you think that's fair enough? And the, related to that on the, on the vaccine rollout, um, decisions have been made up to date, you know, deals that might not have been done last year, that's in the past. What would a Labor government do differently now in terms of being able to boost supply? Is there something that could be done to get more Pfizer, to get more Moderna supply to Australia? What we would have done, of course, was to put in place uh, those mechanisms of more deals with more quantities. That's not uh, a view we hold in retrospect, as you'd be aware, David. It's something that uh, Labor has been saying day after day, week after week, month after month. This government was complacent about uh, not doing deals with Moderna, about meeting with Pfizer firstly in July, but not having any arrangements in place until November. It put all its eggs in the AstraZeneca basket and now the chickens have come home to roost. What we're dealing with now is a need uh, two. As I said, we have a four-point plan. It's one that we, I'm not announcing today. It's one we've been talking about for a year. Uh, why aren't we uh, manufacturing mRNA vaccines here in terms of not just in itself as being good to see us through the current crisis, but I see no reason why Australia, with the expertise that we have in areas like uh, pharmaceuticals and medical biology and in research, uh, can't be at, at the front of uh, pharmaceutical production uh, in our region. Uh, we need to be smarter about it. Uh, I'm somewhat stunned by uh, the uh, statement by uh, the Prime Minister somehow that 18 months into a pandemic, we're going to start developing a plan, seems to be what uh, he announced today. Uh, he should have had one in place a long time earlier. The key is uh, doing more deals and getting more vaccines into more people's arms now, uh, because as, uh, as I've said, it is, uh, it's, uh, it's vaccinations that save lives, not vaccines. And that's the key to opening up. Greg Brown. Greg Brown from The Australian. Mr Albanese, you've ruled out forming a coalition with the Greens. Could you explain the, why Greens and Labor values are incompatible? And given that uh, the polls are close, um, why, in your view, would it be unwise to strike a deal with the Greens that could make it easier to form a government? Uh, we're a party of government. They're a party of protest. I intend to lead a Labor government uh, in its own right. Um, whether it's um, you know, one member, whether it's uh, Bob Catter, Helen Haynes, um, all the rest of them who sit on the crossbench, they'll have a say. After the election, um, I intend to lead a majority Labor government and have no intention and uh, quite clearly will rule out. Uh, the only coalition uh, in this country is between the Liberal and National Party and quite frankly it's a mess and uh, I'd, I'd suggest that it's appropriate that the media concentrate on analysing how it is that this tail of the National Party has wagged the Liberal Party dog so that uh, we now don't have the resources sector in the Cabinet uh, we don't have water in the Cabinet. We don't have a local government minister in this country. We just have a parliamentary secretary. Uh, we have a farcical situation whereby Darren Chester will be sitting on the back bench, uh, the person who uh, was uh, responsible for the... well, was in charge at the time that the Royal Commission into veteran suicide was begun. 
and will be replaced by someone who no one in this room have heard of. Uh, the fact is uh, that the coalition uh, of the Liberal and National Party has caused major problems. I will lead a coherent, united Labor Party, which will be in government after the next election. Just from a values perspective, though, there are some people who believe Labor and the Greens have similar values. What are the divergent values in your view of Labor and the Greens? I have Labor values. Labor values uh, that I was born with. When I came out of the worm, I came out, <laughs> I came out with three great faiths, Catholic Church, the Labor Party, South Sydney Rugby League Football Club. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, throughout whatever, how, whatever difficulties I've had uh, with uh, those three great institutions and faiths, uh, they're still there today. And they affect, uh, they affect uh, my values and who I am, which means that you value work, you value trade unions and you stand up for the party uh, which unashamedly is connected and grew out of the struggles of working people through the trade union movement. Uh, you recognise that you're a party of government that's about changing society and bringing people with you, not waiting for decisions to be made and then deciding whether you'll protest against them or not. Uh, that's not the Labor way. Labor's about real change in the interests of working people, working with people, bringing communities with you, not lecturing them, not looking down on them. That's why I'm in the Labor Party. That's why I'll die as a member of the Australian Labor Party. Um, Mr Albanese, if I could just uh, ask you one question. Uh, I hear what you're saying that, about not forming a coalition of the Greens, but you also did mention the crossbenchers, uh, that you're campaigning to have a um, majority government. But if it was the case that uh, you needed the support of crossbenchers to form government, uh, the independents, would you uh, make public any agreement you made with them about policy, as happens in lots of other parts of the world, like New Zealand or Germany, uh, before you were sworn in as a government? Well, it, uh, it won't happen. In terms of uh, the coalition agreement, I think it is unfortunate that no one knows what's in the agreement of the governing parties in this country between the Liberal and the National parties. But let, let me just make this point. You don't have to be theoretical about it. I'm a former Deputy Prime Minister and uh, under, under Prime Minister Rudd, uh, when I became Deputy Prime Minister, uh, we certainly uh, were in a position whereby there was a potential uh, no confidence motion, of course, on the floor of the parliament. We had 70 votes out of 150. No deals were done. People were given the opportunity. If they wanted to elect Tony Abbott at that point in time, they could have done so uh, that morning. And he could have been sworn in by uh, 9.30 in the morning instead of uh, Kevin Rudd and myself being sworn in as Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, respectively. That's my attitude. I treat people with respect, though, and I treat people in the coalition with respect as well. And one of the things that I did as the leader of government in a parliament that had... Uh, 150 uh, members, but uh, 70 we started with, was treat people with respect, whether they be members of the coalition or members of the crossbenchers. That put us in good stead, I've got to say, and we didn't lose a vote on the floor uh, of that parliament on any legislation, and we were a reforming government. Uh, this current government have a majority They've had a majority since 2013. They've been in office for more than a decade and they've done nothing with it. At the next election, part of the choice will be a Labor government about creating a better Australia and a coalition that have had three terms. They have nothing to point to, no legacy. And I'll be saying to the Australian people, do you really think they're going to get better in their fourth term? Do you really think they're going to get their act together? Or will it be just more focusing on themselves, as we saw last week, the most self-indulgent week in politics that I've seen in my time in public life, and I suspect perhaps the most self-indulgent week in politics since Federation, given the context of a pandemic where there are 12 million Australians locked down today right around the country. And what have they been doing? 
just focusing on themselves. So I think uh, our position will be very clear. I'd take the same attitude that I did. So you don't have to theorise. Go back and have a look at what happened then. I treated, uh, I treated everyone with respect and the, the parliament functioned. It must, I must say, a bit better than it did last week where you had uh, National Party members moving things in the Senate, moving things in the House of Reps, Peter Dutton shutting it down. I mean, it was a farce. If anyone, if anyone was in any doubt that this government has been in office too long, go back and look at that footage. Next question is from Ron Meisen. Thanks, Laura. Ronald Meisen from the Australian Financial Review. Mr Albanese, the doling out of pork is nothing particularly new in election campaigns. Labor was given a slap across the wrist after the 2013 by the Auditor General. You've criticised the government for the car parks rorts for the uh, or various different programs. Going into the next election, as an opposition, will you guarantee not to dole out money in a similar fashion? And in government, would you remove the ability of ministers to be able to circumvent the recommendations and the rankings made by ministers for projects and infrastructure and across the government to ensure that the projects that are most worthy get the funding? When I was infrastructure minister, we funded every single one of the priority projects that Infrastructure Australia recommended. I set up a body with seri a serious body. Its board was Sir Rod Eddington was the chair. Mark Birrell, the former Kennett government minister, was the deputy chair of Infrastructure Australia and the only one with political connections in, in, in his past, but did a terrific job and brought in as the former chair of Infrastructure Partnerships Australia, the private sector body, that expertise. We had Heather Ridout, Kerry Schott, Ken Henry. It was a serious organisation that made recommendations. The sort of projects that we funded, that three that I named in my speech today, Melbourne Metro, Cross River Rail, none of the Melbourne Metro, not necessarily sexy. The big problems in our three major East Coast capitals were congestion in the network, in the City Circle line in Sydney, in the network in, in Melbourne and across the, the river crossing in Brisbane. Uh, all of those things required significant uh, projects uh, that wouldn't immediately uh, get uh, bang for buck in any particular electorate. Uh, they were good projects. This government, this government abandoned the funding for them even though it was in the budget. There was a board member as part of the uh, Melbourne Metro project uh, to their great credit, the Palaszczuk government and uh, the Daniel Andrews government have gone ahead with those two great projects. Managed Motorway Project had uh, benefit cost ratios of up to $13 benefit for every dollar invested. Again, not sexy. How do you fix up congestion on our motorways and make them function more effectively? This government in 2014, in its first budget, removed funding from that program. Look at what we did. The terms of community infrastructure program, we had the funding. I was local government regional development minister. We funded things through local government, based upon local government priorities with local government auditing processes in place. There was nothing like what is going on under this government. Nothing like it at all. We had, we had integrity built into the system by having projects that were, were funded. Firstly, the major part of it that benefited every local government area was on the Commonwealth Grants Commission formula. So very independent, just pressed a button, out came uh, the dollars based upon uh, need and size of the local government areas. And that funded 5,500 projects of which not one, not one has been found to be improper. Not one. Compare that with this mob who think that taxpayers' money is Liberal Party money and who, even when exposed this week, have said, oh, there's nothing wrong with this process. Well, there is. It's a rort. They paid $30 million for a block of land that was worth $3 million. They set up sports rorts. They have regional programs that have funded North Sydney Pool. They have women's sports programs that have funded teams that don't have women's teams in them. And then we have the Urban Congestion Fund, which has been allocated on the basis of uh, colour-coded maps based upon marginality of seats. So just to clarify, 
you know, just clarify then, that's what you did, you, we did in the past. We, well, I would the take that... You will, you will guarantee that there will be I would be take the same principles... ...interventions in those funding programs, those grants programs. No, government, governments make decisions, and of course ministers will make decisions, but it's based upon a process which is there. We are in a democracy, and governments make decisions, and uh, they're elected to do so. The problem here is there's no integrity in the attitude of this government, and they set up in the budget 21 separate funds in this budget and in addition have $9 billion of decisions taken but not announced. That is, they won't tell you how your $9 billion is going to be spent, but they've already made decisions about that. It's just red hot. This government has no shame about the way that they deal with these issues and, and it has, uh, it's all pervasive across portfolios and it goes to the heart of the Prime Minister's office. And the fact that today Bridget McKenzie has been sworn back in as a minister in the Cabinet over, with a portfolio called regionalisation, which by the way is not a word, um, let, let, let alone a portfolio or a job, at the same time as water and resources are not in the Cabinet, says it all about this government. Paul Carp. Paul Carp from Guardian Australia. Thanks very much for your speech. Could I please ask about the goal of full employment? Is Labor committed to using fiscal policy to put more money into the economy until it achieves that goal? And will you rule out trying to beat the coalition by promising greater fiscal repair, as Kevin Rudd did when he declared that John Howard's fiscal recklessness must stop? Uh, we'll have appropriate fiscal policy for the times. And what that means is that uh, there are times, including during a recession, uh, whereby uh, you have to loosen fiscal policy as well as monetary policy at, at this stage are both in the same uh, direction of expansionary uh, policy, uh, that's appropriate uh, when you've had a recession. But it's the quality of the spend that's the problem as well. Uh, you need to have uh, spending that boosts productivity that actually leaves a legacy. The problem I have and I've got to say, as Infrastructure Minister, I, I find it difficult to comprehend how you can have a trillion dollars of debt, a hundred billion dollars of new spending this budget, six months earlier, an additional hundred billion dollars of new spending, and no legacy. There's no major projects have been announced by this government in recent times in those two budgets. It's just extraordinary. Indeed, um, a cut in the May budget to infrastructure investment. So it's a matter of the right policy uh, for the right time. Uh, at the next uh, election, we will have all of our expenditure and our revenue measures all fully on display uh, for all to see well before the election. Uh, but there are times when uh, fiscal policy is, is uh, useful in terms of stimulating the economy. But in the long run as well, you do have to recognise that debt does have to be repaid. And this government and the IGR report uh, shows just red ink off into the never-never. And I, I, remind, uh, I remind viewers that uh, this government was elected uh, in 2013, promising a surplus in its first year and every year thereafter, and that they had doubled the debt prior to the pandemic, doubled the debt, with nothing to show for it, and uh, they, some of the waste that's there, we certainly can cut back on. But, but the election must be in the next year, so we have a pretty good idea how we're faring going into it. You, you don't want to rule out taking greater fiscal repair than the coalition into this next election? I, I, I'd be happy for you to attend my campaign launch, uh, which will be uh, occurring. We've actually set where it'll be. Paul Erickson and I know, and that makes two uh, <laughs> who, who, who know that. And uh, we'll be making all of our announcements well beforehand, but just to your left, there's Katie Gallagher. She'll make sure, as our Shadow Finance Minister, uh, that every dollar that we invest is a dollar that's worthwhile, that's going to produce 
an outcome for the country, not an outcome for a marginal seat, an outcome for the country. Tom Lowry. Thanks, Mr Albanese. Just on Tasmanian politics, actually, David O'Byrne has stepped aside as leader of the Tasmanian Labor Party. He's apologised to a woman who accused him of sexual harassment. Should he stay on as leader of Tasmanian Labor? And separately to that, there are more widespread allegations of sexual harassment in Tasmanian Labor, some evidence of which has been presented to your office. Is it time for the national executive to intervene there? Well, look, we have an internal process on matters of uh, any complaints which are made. Uh, part of that internal process is respecting confidentiality and not commenting on it. And I intend to respect that process. So no further comment whatsoever on I intend to respect that process. Uh, and uh, that requires uh, confidentiality and it requires uh, people to, uh, to not speculate, uh, but to allow those processes uh, to take their course. Can I ask you then, finally, are you concerned at all by the allegations in Tasmanian Labor of... I, 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 do, I don't intend to make any comment because our policy that's been adopted consistently by the National Executive unanimously after an extensive process. And uh, there's a bit of debate in uh, this building up the hill about what processes should be. The Labor Party's been ahead of that. Uh, a lot of people did a lot of work uh, led by... Our, our caucus chair, uh, Sharon Clayton, and others uh, to ensure that there was a process with integrity that's known to everyone that will be uh, put into practice, and that is what I intend to do. Georgie Moore. Georgie Moore from AAP. Victoria's Mental Health Royal Commission earlier this year said the state's structural problems were the rest of the country's problems. Its problems were unique. And the ROCO recommended, among other things, a levy to fund an overhaul of its system, which Victorian Labor took up for businesses. Given the fact that the country's broader mental health infrastructure is widely considered to be failing the most vulnerable people, can you say if Federal Labor will consider a, simple, a similar mental health levy um, to help more people access more and better treatment across Australia? Um, no, that's not in consideration by us. Um, can I uh, make this point about uh, the budget as well, which had additional funding uh, for mental health uh, in uh, the budget uh, in May? I thought that was one of the things that the government got right. Rachel Baxter. Hello, Rachel Baxter, Channel 9. Um, just taking you back to National Cabinet this morning, the PM has decided to put a 50% cap on international arrivals or reduce the cap to 50, by 50%. Do you agree with that decision? I, I, I'm not sure it's the PM decided, given... Well, the National uh, Cabinet has decided. Given, given the process. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I think that uh, we need to fix the rollout of the vaccine, and we need to fix national quarantine. And uh, the Prime Minister only ever acts too late, something that uh, I think characterises his uh, lack of leadership is whether you look at the bushfire crisis, whether you look at the need for wage subsidies, whether you look at the rollout of the vaccine, whether you look at national quarantine, there's drift, 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 and then only when there's a crisis is there then belated action, which isn't as effective as it should be because time's passed on. And I think this is one of the issues. We should have uh, appropriate quarantine facilities that allow people to come home. There have been no breaches from Howard Springs. Uh, we have Toowoomba, or well camp, uh, next to, to the uh, airport at Toowoomba. We have a proposal I've met with Mr Wagner. He doesn't require any Commonwealth or state funding. Uh, this is someone with a record of being able to deliver infrastructure. He says that you can have 600 bed facility up and running in 12 weeks, and I don't doubt that he would be able to achieve that. And you have uh, a, a Prime Minister who has said day after day after day, uh, having said that all Australians who were stranded would be home by Christmas, has said, 
We don't need national quarantine facilities. The hotel quarantine system's fine. The truth is it's not. Hotels were built for tourists. They weren't built as medical facilities. And uh, at the same time, rejecting a proposal like the Toowoomba one, which was first proposed by Premier Palaszczuk last October. On that basis, it could have been up and running by January and could have been operating with 1,000 beds for a long period of time. We haven't had the expansion of Howard Springs yet that we talked about in terms of the numbers. Remember the wartime footing? That was about six weeks ago before a national cabinet meeting. You know, I await another change in policy in a week's time. Uh, this Prime Minister is, a, is someone who reacts rather than leads, and I think this is an example of it, whereby he's reacted because of the fact that 12 million Australians are uh, locked down and that there have been 26 breaches from a quarantine system that he says is just hunky-dory. You mentioned vaccinations, obviously, so important. If you were Prime Minister right now, what would be the magic number of vaccinations before we could open up the country? More. A lot more. But do you have a number um, Look, it, I would take the advice of the health experts. Um, you know, one of the things that's probably a good idea is that uh, if you have a national cabinet process... Uh, you don't go out and make an announcement late at night afterwards that you don't explain after you haven't consulted with uh, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation or the AMA or, or the people, the premiers and chief ministers that you just met with, that you just met with. Probably a good idea if you actually consult widely and take the advice from the health experts. And if I was Prime Minister... I'd be taking advice of health experts when it comes to health issues. If I could just um, ask a, a sort of supplementary question on that. Um, Mary, Ma uh, Mary Louise McClaws uh, has been long advocating that given that uh, CAPS are, are leaving a lot of people stranded overseas, would it make sense for uh, the Australian government to be sending uh, uh, vaccines to our embassies around the world in particular places where there are a lot of people so that Australians trying to come home could come home vaccinated and possibly go into the home quarantine system that's been flagged uh, today? Of course it would. I mean, some of this is just common sense. I proposed uh, more than a year ago now, more than a year ago, for example, as well, that we use the VIP fleet, um, the Air Force jets, uh, to bring Australians home, particularly uh, from our region. Um, what happens is that the Air Force uh, have to have so many flying hours, so basically they, if, if they aren't being used, uh, they're flying around not full in order to get those hours up. It's one of the things that you have to do. One of the things that's happening with aircraft in the middle of Australia is that they're being started up and used empty because you can't leave an aircraft just still. It's a bit like a other vehicles, um, you can't just leave them there because it creates a problem for their functionality and for their safety. Um, we have never had more aviation assets at our disposal than we have had in the last year and we can't bring Australians home. It, it makes no sense. And the key is get the national quarantine system right, get the rollout of the vaccine right, and we can avoid some of these problems. My heart goes out uh, to some of the stories which are there. And the Prime Minister should have been reminded recently that you can take a couple of planes uh, to the UK um, and uh, come home after a few days. He could have just asked himself. Mark Kenny. Mark Kenny, Mr Albanese from the Press Club Board and indeed ANU. And congratulations on pork and ride. Uh, I think there'd be a few headline writers around the country who'd be thinking, I wish I thought of that. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, we live in the uh, most uh, vibrant and fastest growing economic region of the world. Um, obviously, the, 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 the giant in that room is China, yet relations with that country are uh, at an all-time low. Fifty years ago today, or this week anyway, uh, a former opposition leader, former Labor opposition leader who became Prime Minister Gough Whitlam, 
uh, controversially led a, a visit to Beijing, or Peking as it was called then, to uh, begin the process of normalising relations. I wonder whether there's any scope for a current opposition leader to uh, uh, open up such uh, communications, given that they seem uh, beyond the government. China has changed under, under Xi, and we saw that uh, with the speech uh, that he gave uh, for the centenary of uh, the Chinese Communist Party just in the, last, uh, in the last day. And the truth is that whoever was in government at this period of time uh, would have to be navigating the, diff the different environment uh, which is there, with uh, China making decisions uh, against Australia's national interest. And so my view is that Australia should always uh, stand up for our national interest and for our sovereignty and for human rights. So on issues like uh, the South China Sea, the treatment of Uyghurs, Hong Kong and a range of other issues, there is no difference whatsoever in Australian politics on those issues. The question is how we navigate those things going forward. And I'm a supporter of the Biden administration's classification of competition without catastrophe. And I think that's a, a useful starting point for how we navigate going forward. We have to live uh, with uh, the, the circumstance which is there of uh, uh, two uh, competing uh, powers in the United States and China. Australia under Labor, it must be said, picked a side some time ago when we formed the alliance with the United States. As, uh, as a democratic nation, we do have different values from China. And uh, that's something that uh, enjoys uh, bipartisanship. And I'm pleased that under the Biden administration, there's a return to diplomacy and a return to engagement and a normalisation of international uh, politics under the leadership of the United States, which, shall we say, less uncertainty than was there under the previous administration uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Donald Trump. Um, I look forward, as uh, a Labor Prime Minister, in working with the Biden administration. I'm, I'm not sure how uh, uh, other issues would have been dealt with. I certainly wouldn't have attended a, uh, a, a rally in Ohio like the current Prime Minister did. Uh, but uh, I look forward to that. Uh, I've met President Biden. I have good relationships with senior members in the US administration and I think working with the US, working with our partners in the region, uh, but also recognising that we have an economic interest in, uh, in engagement uh, with China. Uh, there are many jobs which are dependent uh, upon that relationship, but it's a matter of tackling it in a, in a mature way, but also recognising uh, that uh, things are going to be difficult uh, for some time and recognising that uh, China is responsible uh, for the difficulties which have arisen. Anna Henderson. Anna Henderson, SBS World News. Uh, we're seeing an increasing amount of very visible military involvement in the Prime Minister's communications on the rollout do you agree with the way that that is being run? Do you think that the military should have a role, for example, as we're hearing in potentially arranging a public communications campaign uh, on, on the vaccination program? Uh, would you do the same thing? Um, I haven't heard of that announcement because I've, I've been here. Uh, let me must... I'll, I'll leave it with this, that our Australian Defence Forces are worthy of our respect each and every day and our thanks uh, for the work that they do. Uh, but that's the work that they do. I'm not sure that uh, public information campaigns is, is in, their, um, in their job description. Uh, but, uh, you know, people will draw their own conclusions as to uh, the way that Scott Morrison chooses uh, to uh, run issues consistently across portfolios that he's held, it must be said. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's Scott Morrison who is accountable uh, for decisions that are made and that uh, we should always ensure 
uh, that uh, that political line of sight uh, is there and there's no attempt uh, to disrupt that line of sight. The final question is from Tai Sokiyuchi. Thank you. Tai Sokiyuchi from SBS. Um, you mentioned Joe, the prospect of uh, greater stability uh, in the region, just back on China under the leadership of Joe Biden. Um, we still had President Xi yesterday saying, and, and I quote, um, anyone who dares subjugate or oppress China will find their heads bashed bloody against a, a great steel wall. Um, how worried are you about this kind of rhetoric? And um, do you see any way that Australia can re-engage with China in this current climate? Well, that's uh, the rhetorical position I spoke about. Um, but, uh, you know, people send... Uh, political leaders sometimes send domestic messages and uh, it's not just in China that that happens, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is a, a difficult position to navigate. Uh, I gave a major speech on the day in which uh, Joe Biden was sworn in as president. I think we need to be consistent uh, about our values. Our values are democratic. What that means is being prepared to, to criticise uh, regimes and the differences that we have uh, with regimes that, that aren't democratic, that has consequences. Um, we should also make sure that we cherish our, our democratic institutions within, which is why I think it was uh, disappointing uh, that uh, of all the world's uh, Western and democratic leaders, ours was the only one who was not uh, appropriately critical of the insurrection that occurred on the Capitol building. Uh, I think we need to be consistent. I'll be consistent. I'll stand up for democratic values. I'll stand up for our alliance with the United States as being our most important, of engagement uh, in our region. And I have uh, good uh, relations uh, with uh, a, a range of, uh, of leaders and, and prominent people in the region from the time in which I've served as Deputy Prime Minister in, uh, and in other portfolios. And I'm very confident that uh, I look forward to uh, Foreign Minister Penny Wong uh, representing Australia on, on the foreign stage. Uh, I think that she would be, she will be uh, an outstanding representative and will, will do us proud each and every day and I think that is uh, that will be I think uh, an important moment in our history and we'll say a lot as well about the nature of modern Australia uh, but we'll continue to stand up for our values our values are different from from China that doesn't mean that we can't uh, treat each other uh, with respect that we shouldn't engage in in diplomatic uh, relations of course we should and uh, Gough Whitlam was right uh, to begin those, uh, those diplomatic relations, as was uh, Dr Kissinger and others in the, the US administration uh, correct as well. Uh, we need to, though, recognise uh, that uh, these issues are complex, uh, but I look forward to being in a position to be able to help manage them. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Anthony Albanese.